So I went up to the kitchen to make myself soup and then the doorbell rang. And I thought, okay, well, I'm up. So I went to go and answer it. Uh, And when I went downstairs, I opened the door and the guy from Twitter was stood there uh, quite smartly dressed. I don't really remember exactly what he was wearing, but I think he was wearing like quite a smart coat and a scarf. And he said he said hello and I screamed and shut the door. I think it was like a two second. As soon as I opened it, it was like my worst nightmare had come true, like the thing that I'd been picturing. I'm Jamie Beebe. And I'm Jake Deptula. On today's episode of Strictly Stalking, we're chatting with Beth Rylance, who was stalked by a stranger online. After graduating from university, Beth returned home and began receiving notifications on Twitter from a man in his late 50s who responded to almost every one of her tweets. He told her how much he missed her, wrote blog posts about her, and posted videos he made calling her his woman. After Beth blocked him, he reached out to her friends, asking them to get in touch with her. Eventually, he showed up at her front door, refusing to leave until he saw her. Beth, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, Well, I am an actress and a writer. Uh, I've been doing that since I was about 16 years old. So that's, I'm 29 now. So I've been doing it for about 13 years. Uh, Yeah, and I live in London. I grew up here and that is where I was when my stalker turned up. Tell us a little bit about your life right before you encountered your soccer. How was life going? I just finished university. Um, I think it was the the Christmas or the sort of like the winter time after I'd finished, after I'd graduated. Um, so I'd moved back home to London and I was living with my dad uh, at that point in time, just the two of us. Um So yeah, I was just looking for work, but living at home, hadn't moved out yet. And that was where I was when it all happened. I just started noticing this account that was responding to a lot of my uh, stuff online. Uh, It didn't seem too unusual at the time. Like I think it just felt quite intense, but I wasn't At no point did I think I was being stalked or harassed or any of those things because none of the messages were sort of aggressive or upsetting. They were just quite odd and a bit off because you could sort of tell that he thought that he was responding like directly to me. They sort of were like a bit too over familiar. And the more that they went on, that was the more that I realized that something weird was going on. So yeah, I think it was, he started sending me like, photo replies to tweets and things I think once he sent me a picture of his like pantry cupboard like about how he'd organized it in response to a tweet I'd done about like tidying up or something so it it, you could tell that the boundaries had kind of been slightly crossed at that point but yeah it was on Twitter is this something that you had kind of ran into before being in the public eye and you know being an actress in no way at all like I think I I've had a few things with Twitter where I you you've sort of find out that it's it can really blow up like you can do one tweet and I think so many people have experienced things like that in many different ways and I'd had like a couple of things where you sort of go oh god I don't ever want to go on Twitter again after that this was one of them <laughs> um but yeah I think I hadn't experienced anything like this before. And even with this guy, I think I still, to this day, I'm quite unaware of what it was that like attracted him to me. Cause I don't think at any point he sort of, it wasn't like he had seen me in a TV show or like any of these sort of things. It didn't appear like that anyway. It just seemed like he'd kind of come across my Twitter profile online and got quite fixated on it because it ne- there was never like, the initial like tweet of going oh I saw you in the show it was great none of that it was just straight into like thinking it was one-on-one contact who was the first person you shared this with I think the first person I shared it with was probably I definitely told my boyfriend and and a friend of mine um it was after 
and and I I don't think I mentioned it like when there were lots of sort of incessant tweets and uh, like favoriting and like liking lots of tweets. I'm not sure I fully mentioned it to anyone then because it just wasn't really the kind of thing you said out loud. Um, but then he sent me. I think I'd muted him, so it meant that even if he was replying to things, I wouldn't see them in my. Um, in my notifications but for example if I clicked on my own tweet or something I would see his response underneath and doing that once by chance I came across a reply to one of my tweets that had a link um he said it was a letter to me and I clicked on it and it was a blog post on uh his own like website that he'd made um and it was just entitled Beth and it had like a it was sort of like a letter written to me. It said, um, I think it said like, Beth, I feel like we're talking, are we? He talked about the fact that he was coming to London for work in November, that he wanted to meet with me. Uh, he put his personal mobile number and email address on it. Um, and that really freaked me out because suddenly it, it all of the sort of uh, odd tweets suddenly like snowballed and added up to going oh god this guy is not scary but like he obviously has taken something from this that is not there that I have done nothing to um sort of facilitate and I I screenshotted it and I sent it to my friend and I showed it to my boyfriend in person later that day I think um so yeah they were the first people that I told and obviously that was quite an extreme thing to suddenly happen out of nowhere. So that was the other yeah, first thing that I mentioned to anyone. How did they react when you showed that to them? I think they were quite shocked. My friend was found it very scary. Uh, and my boyfriend was like, you need to block this guy. So I think after I showed him that, he sort of looked at the profile. He was like, show me this guy's Twitter. And we like went through it and... My boyfriend was like, you need to block him. And he had my phone uh, and he pressed the block button, which at the time was very close to the follow button on the like Twitter app. And he accidentally clicked follow. Um, but because we were on the underground on the tube where we don't have Wi-Fi, I, we panicked for a hot second and then thought, oh, it's going to be fine because we're not connected to the internet. So that can't have gone through. Um, and then blocked him properly. Um, so yeah, they were they were quite protective and like quick to act on it in a situation where I definitely like, I'm sure even if I hadn't told anyone, I would have blocked him, but I think I would have been quite scared if I hadn't sort of reached out to other people for advice on it. We deserve better than having to choose between either cheap disposable razors or overpriced brands. We sure do. I'm tired of using poorly designed razors that cut me and give me razor burn. Or they simply don't give me a good shave. There's no better feeling than freshly shaved legs. Thankfully, we found the Athena Club Razor. The Athena Club Razor is expertly designed with the sharpest patented blades on the market, so no more prickles right after shaving. These one-of-a-kind blades are enhanced with a revolutionary water-activated serum that has shea butter and hyaluronic acid for a soothing shave with maximum hydration. In fact, the Athena Club razor is the only razor designed with hyaluronic acid. I love the Cloud Shave Foam because it lets me get a close shave and absolutely no razor burn. It's the smoothest and closest shave I can get. The best part is the razor kit is only $9, which includes two five-blade razor heads, your choice of a razor handle color, and a magnetic holder for easy storage. I got a pink razor and really love the magnetic holder. So easy to use and keeps my razor nice and clean. And I get new blades shipped regularly, so I never run out. And it doesn't stop at incredible razors with Athena Club. They carry all the self-care essentials you need from period care to body care, and even a probiotic and multivitamin. And every product is vegan and cruelty-free. Stop using razors that under-deliver and switch to Athena Club. Sign up today and you'll get 20% off your first order. Just go to athenaclub.com and use promo code STOCKING. That's athenaclub.com and use promo code STOCKING for 20% off your first order. What happened next after you blocked him? Um, so I think because I'd received that blog, it panicked me and I definitely wanted to keep an eye on this guy because, you know, he obviously 
had bigger ideas about what was going on. Uh, and that was scary. And I think a bit, so I, I kept checking on his profile because he still kept tweeting at me, about me. Um, he did another blog post, which was, it was, it he could it was obviously like he could tell that that wasn't okay but he was sort of going a bit further into it like it had sort of descended into a bit more madness I don't think I have screenshots of that one so I don't exactly remember what it said but it was quite intense and like talking as if we had a relationship as opposed to the first one which was asking you know are we talking I feel like we are which we weren't (laughs) um so yeah I sort of kept an eye on that and it was just really frustrating. Like I said, I wrote in my, uh, in the blog, I wrote about it like two, maybe three years after it happened. I said, it felt a bit like having nits or like head lice. Like you feel like you can't get rid of it. You want to like scrub it off, but you can't really because you don't have control over that person because you don't know who they are and he just wouldn't go away. So obviously he was blocked Um, But I think at that point in time with Twitter, um, especially, well, if you had a public profile, even if you did block them, they could still see and search for you and see everything that you did. It just meant they couldn't use your username. So they couldn't directly tweet you or direct message you, but he could still see everything on my profile. So every tweet I did, my picture, like all those things. And, um, at that point in time, he was still responding to every tweet I did on his own profile without adding me into it. So all of the messages were sort of like in, like directed to somebody that was very clearly me from, from reading them from my perspective. Uh, and that was quite upsetting and frustrating, like I said, because you just want it to go away and and you can't stop it because you don't know this person. So you don't, and you also don't want to directly reach out to them and tell them to stop because then you're contacting them. He, during this period of time, got in touch with my friend, Ella, who I had, um, I've known for many years, but we'd also done some acting together. He shared like a couple of videos of us performing, um, calling me his woman and things like that. Uh, and then messaged her on Twitter saying he wanted to speak to me and could she put us in touch. So she then immediately got in touch with me and went, oh my God, I've had a message from that guy because she was the same friend that I shared the blog post with uh, at the beginning. And I asked her if she would respond saying, you know, please do not contact me or her. She doesn't know who you are and she doesn't want to speak to her. Please leave her alone. Um, which she was quite nervous to do because obviously she didn't want to engage with him, but he had like, you know, sought her out and sent her, I think he sent her a direct message as opposed to like a public tweet. Um, At which point he then deleted all of his tweets. It was like a big, um, it was like a pattern of his that he would often do that where I think even in the first blog post that he wrote to me, it said, please let me know in like true espionage fashion when this needs to self-destruct, which was quite weird. And I, at the time, like did not understand what that meant at all because I wasn't speaking to him, but also it seems like he sort of cleared the, the history of things. Like he'd have a freak out about something and then just delete all of his tweets. So then there was no evidence whatsoever of all the things that he had said and all of that. So yeah. I was guessing, was this happening daily? I think like, especially early doors, like, it, you know, it depended on how many tweets I was doing really, which sounds weird. But, you know, if I, I, I don't particularly remember that if I hadn't tweeted something that, that he would respond or send a message out of the blue, but very much if I'd done a tweet, he would respond to it as if it was like a text message kind of thing. How did it impact your ability to share things on social media i think it it was just quite frustrating because i tended to use twitter in like quite a light-hearted like funny way to like write jokes out and do things that i found funny or entertaining 
And then suddenly this sort of made it all feel quite like toxic and poisonous and not a nice place to be because I had this like shadow that was sort of there the whole time. Um, I think I, a few times throughout this, the process, I made my Twitter account private. So it was locked um, because I didn't want him especially at the time when I had blocked him, but he could still see everything. The only solution to that was to make my account private. I'm I'm sure there is a world where I could have just stopped using it completely. Um, but from how the story ended up going, that wouldn't have changed it at all. Wouldn't you love if every clothing store you shopped at already understood your loves, hates, and total no-go zones? Well, there's a company focused on making that happen, Stitch Fix. Stitch Fix is a personal styling company that brings you the world of fashion and style. It's a completely different and fun way to find clothes that you will love. It's all about you every time. In the world of clothes shopping, there are no consistent sizes. Why should we have to try to guess if a medium is really a medium or constantly have to return clothes purchased online to find something that fits perfectly? So true. And as fashion changes, true style doesn't. Even so, your timeless look can use a pick-me-up every once in a while. Get help from someone who gets what you're going for without ever leaving home with a Stitch Fix styling expert. To get started, go to stitchfix.com slash stalking to set up your profile and they'll deliver great looks personalized just for you in your color, styles, and budget. You pay a $20 styling fee for each fix, which is credited towards anything you keep. Schedule at any time. There's no subscription required. Plus, shipping, returns, and exchanges are easy and free. Stitch Fix does all the hard work for you, making great style effortless for everybody, including women, men, and kids. Get started today at stitchfix.com slash stocking, and you'll get 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. That's stitchfix.com slash stocking for 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. Stitchfix.com slash stocking. Get started today. Did you, uh, did you ever think about reaching out to him yourself and asking him to stop? No. I think I so, I found that blog post so scary. The idea of like ever personally contacting him was very overwhelming and like, I didn't like it. I think I definitely at some points like reached quite a height of frustration with it where I would do tweets because I knew he was reading them saying to the person who da 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 da, like I'm, uh, who's constantly tweeting me or you know tweeting about me and reading this I can't block you you know I don't know who you are and I don't want any contact with you and I have reached out to Twitter to ro- try and report you and like just stop it and again he would do something like delete all of the tweet his tweets so but then like I would still be keeping an eye on it because two weeks later he'd start doing it again there'd be like real like low like low activity periods and then suddenly it would like hype up again and I suppose that was I think I was very frustrated and like I said I didn't want to reach out to him directly but I'm sure that kind of fueled the fire because it you know he would delete all the tweets but then he'd come back again because he knew that I was seeing what he was doing so I suppose that was like to my detriment but also I was in a very weird position and just didn't want it to be happening anymore. Beth, did you ever try to search him based on the information he provided you? No, I think it was only the Twitter. He tried to add me on Facebook uh, and I immediately declined and blocked him on Facebook. Um, I think that was probably in like just after I'd blocked him on Twitter. So he'd like, he tried to reach out to me in other ways, uh, as in through Facebook. I think he also tried to follow me on Instagram, um, which I've always had a private Instagram regardless. So I just deleted, like deleted the request and blocked it as well so that he couldn't. And luckily with stuff like Instagram and Facebook, if you block someone, they're blocked. There's no way of them, like unless they set up a new profile, trying to being able to see what you do. So yeah, I didn't ever like Google his name or like any of those things. I think because Twitter was the alley that it was from, that was where I focused my like knowledge of him. What happened next after the harassment continued online? So 
after he'd messaged my friend and then sort of would continue to, you know, do these tweets and then delete lots of them that were all directed at me. Um, the rules, like the Twitter rules on blocking changed. So, and this was in like, it was like a four or five month period of time where it all suddenly changed. I can't remember if it was to do with I think there was like a celebrity in England that made that happen or maybe there was a reason why it got implemented. I'm not entirely sure, but it was very relieving because like it was a huge relief to know that finally he couldn't see what I was up to. But also I could still see his profile and he was still doing the same things. Um, and I think there was, he would post photos of him in London, not of him, but him you know, with London streets and stuff, uh, like Oxford Street, which is like a big shopping street in central London where lots of people go. And often like as a performer, that's where a lot of the auditions are in London. There's like a lot of production offices and casting offices around there and around Soho. Uh, so the idea that I could like be walking along Oxford Street and suddenly see him was very scary. Uh, I think also always in the back of my mind in that blog he'd written, he said he was going to be in London in November and that was why he was asking to meet up with me. So that was kind of always in the back of my mind, knowing that he was going to be in the city that I lived in, in that period of time. And that his sort of like interest in me hadn't dropped, uh, that it clearly was something that was still very like on his mind. Um, so that was very scary. I also tried to reach out because Twitter was very bad with this kind of stuff at the time. Like I said, he kept deleting his tweets. So whenever I tried to report it and saying, you know, this is a tweet about me, this guy has been sort of harassing me indirectly on uh, Twitter since July, that he'd delete his tweets. So they had nothing to go off and they, I would just sort of get an automated response saying this, you know, there's nothing wrong with this tweet, this tweet, or it doesn't exist anymore. Um, and I wasn't taking screenshots of stuff that he said at that time, because I don't think I realized what position I was in. Uh, I reached out to something I saw on Twitter, which was like a women's charity that were trying to help women who were being harassed on Twitter. And it was an American uh, organization. And that was the turning point for me, I think was when I was sort of in this email conversation with this woman who was trying to help me. And she said, what evidence do you have? And I realized I didn't have any, like I had been trying to report these tweets so often, uh, and they were all deleted and she suffered with the same issue of going any time that she, could see he'd said all these things if she was also reporting them to Twitter to try and help me. Uh, they would say the same thing to her. Um, and I sent her the screenshot of the blog post that I had that I'd sent to my friend initially, which was the only reason I had a screenshot of it because I'd just taken it on my phone and like WhatsApped it to her going, oh my God, what do I do? Um, so yeah, that was definitely the point in time that I sort of freaked out about it a bit and started worrying that I might bump into him. Um, but once I, you know, thought that he wasn't in London anymore, it's, I think he'd said it was like a two week period or something. He'd literally outlined the dates in that blog. Once that was over and done with, I think I kind of settled down a bit more because I thought, oh God, this is so mad. Like it's it's really mad that you think you're going to bump into this guy that you don't know, you've never met and that you like have not had any sort of interaction with at all. Um, that I kind of convinced myself that it was very unrealistic that something like that would happen, probably to try and comfort myself and to just move on with my life a bit. Um, so I think for like a good month or so, I did manage to like get out of the habit of looking at his profile and like checking in on him and worrying about where he was and if I would bump into him, sort of get on with my life. Uh, and that is the point when a month later he turned up on my doorstep. How did you know what he looked like? It was purely from his profile picture. 
which was petrifying. Like it looked like a crime photo fit. It didn't look like a real person to me, but he was quite like middle-aged. He had gray hair. He just looked like you wouldn't want to bump into him on the street, on the street, which <laughs> was what I was worried about doing. But he, yeah, it it was just that. I think also at a certain point in time, he'd been posting YouTube videos of himself, like 15 minute long YouTube videos, which were kind of addressed to me as well. Like I genuinely couldn't watch them because they made my skin crawl. But I think my boyfriend looked at one of them and it's basically like he's doing a vlog or was doing a vlog to me to show me what he was doing like making cups of tea and things. So like I knew again, like the, the, he looked like he did in his photo in that, you know, the screenshots of the video or the sort of, whatever you call it, the key picture. What exactly did the blog post say? So it says, it goes, Beth, are we talking to each other? I like to think that we are, but then again, I might just be imagining it. Certainly I do feel that we have something in common and it would be nice if we could set up some kind of friendship slash relationship. Tell me, is that way off the mark? I'll give you my email and mobile, then they're underneath. Then if you do feel like talking, you'll be able to do it a bit more privately than Twitter. I'll be coming to London for a six week training course from the 3rd of November. So if you did want to meet up, that might be a good time to do it. There, there's so much I want to talk about with you. So, so much. Maybe November is too far away. Let me know how you feel about all that with love and then his name. And then it says, P.S. In true espionage style, let me know when this page should self-destruct. Like it was so intense to just get that out of the blue. Like it was quite petrifying. Tell us about the day he showed up at your house. So like I said, I was still living at home with my dad and he was out at work. Um, It was about 10 days before Christmas. And I wasn't feeling very well so I'd like been in bed all day uh or had decided not to get out of bed in the first place because I was like I feel gross and I don't want to get up uh and I was home alone and I think the doorbell started ringing at about 10 a.m in the morning uh and I assumed it was like uh the postman or like deliveries my dad had been buying a lot of stuff from Amazon and from the States to give people for Christmas. It had kind of been a thing that had been happening since November. So I was like, oh God, there's, I don't want to go downstairs and answer the door. It's just going to be packages and I'll go and pick them up from the post office later or they'll leave them outside the door or whatever. Um, so I think the doorbell rang about five times and I was kind of in and out of sleep because I was in bed. And at one point, maybe about 1 p.m., I got up to like make myself some soup. So we were living in a like in a upstairs flat um, and the bedrooms were on the first floor and then the kitchen was on the top floor. So I went up to the kitchen to make myself soup and then the doorbell rang. And I thought, okay, well, I'm up. So I went to go and answer it. Uh, and when I went downstairs, I opened the door and the guy from Twitter was stood there, uh, quite smartly dressed. I don't really remember exactly what he was wearing, but I think he was wearing like quite a smart coat and a scarf. And he said, he said, hello. And I screamed and shut the door. I think it was like a two second as soon as I opened it, it was like my worst nightmare had come true, like the thing that I'd been picturing and worrying about happening like in the middle of nowhere or like on a random street in London was now like on my doorstep. So that was obviously horrifying. Uh, and then I, you know, ran upstairs and rang the police and was kind of hyperventilating, crying a lot because I couldn't believe that this was happening. But also I think, like you asked before, who were the first people that I told about this? I don't think I'd mentioned it to my dad because again, it feels like quite an odd thing to talk about, to go to your dad. Some guy has been liking a lot of my tweets or like tweeting about me. I think maybe I'd mentioned it in passing that there was someone who had kind of overstepped the mark a bit, but I I hadn't sort of talked to him about 
worrying about seeing this guy on the street and now all of a sudden he was on the doorstep of the house that I lived in with my dad. Um, so when I was on the phone to the police and I, I said, there's a, a man outside of my house who has been harassing me and stalking me online. I've never met him before. I don't know how he's got my address. He's outside. I think I was very worried that he would leave. Um, and I wanted to make sure that didn't happen because I was very scared of him. And obviously now he knew where I lived. Um, so they sent a police car out straight away. I think it got there within like three minutes. It was very, very good. And the dispatcher was like, do you want me to stay on the phone with you till the police get there? And I went, no, I want to call my dad. So I called my dad and explained to him what had happened. Again, I think he was quite overwhelmed because he had no idea really about the situation. And I had to kind of explain it in like one minute flat of going whilst crying and not being able to breathe properly. Um, so yeah, then the police got there and I was just worried that he would have walked away because it wasn't a good reception at all. And that maybe, you know, even if he hadn't got the picture from the time he'd been asked to leave me alone and stop contacting me and the fact that I he was blocked and couldn't see what I did, you know, he was now on my doorstep and had had a door slammed in his face. Even that didn't resonate with him. Um, he was sat tweeting outside my house Um which I showed the police because they, you know, obviously asked me, how do you know this man? Um, and I explained the situation and they went, do you have any evidence of that? So I went, all I have is I can show you his profile. And we looked at it together and there were tweets from like the, the two or three days before he turned up at my house, um, detailing all the places he was walking around the area that I lived in looking for me. He'd been tweeting that morning saying, I tried ringing the door, ringing the bell, but it doesn't seem you're in. I'll try again in half an hour. So every time the doorbell had rung that morning whilst I was sick in bed, it was him. It wasn't anyone else. He just kept repeatedly ringing. I don't know if he'd been sat out there waiting or because um, I'd been upstairs and not answering the door. Um, and then when I ran upstairs and slammed and locked the door, he tweeted, um, when you get over your shock, come back downstairs and I'll take you for a coffee. So these were all things that I had to show the police and going, this is why I haven't been able to report any of this because you can see all these tweets are about me, but they don't have my name in them. And I've tried to report it to Twitter. I think they asked why I hadn't told the police before. And I went, because if Twitter don't take it seriously, why would the police, like I didn't, feel like I was in that bad a situation. They questioned him as well. Two police officers came and one came upstairs with me uh, and one stayed down there with him because he hadn't gone anywhere. He was just sat on the doorstep when they arrived. Um, and he said he knew me. He said we were in a relationship. He said that we'd been going out for like a few months, that we'd been introduced by a movie producer, which was just mad because I was like, who, please can I have their number? You know, like it was just mad. And the police could obviously see I was very distressed and didn't know who this person was and told him that they said, it's very clear that this woman upstairs is very distressed by you being here and she says she doesn't know you and that you've been harassing her um and they sort of gave us two options to choose from they said either you can both sign something like a piece of paper basically sort of like a, a written contract that says he will leave you alone and not do this again or we can arrest him uh, and I think when they offered up the first option, I was so petrified that they, that was like the worst thing that they were going to do, considering that like every time that I'd, you know, tried to call him out on Twitter or sort of stop this thing happening, it didn't stop him. Like he just carried on and carried on and it had got to the point that he turned up on my doorstep. So I didn't want him to just sort of go away with like a slapped wrist and just do it all over again, especially now that he knew where I lived. Um, so they arrested him and he was charged with harassment and stalking. 
uh, which he pleaded not guilty to, and he was released on bail. Um, but he was taken to the to the prison uh, near in the same like area as my house. So I was very very clear with the police that I wanted to know what was going on and if they could like call me the next day to tell me if he'd been released or if he was going to be staying in jail or like what was happening and I heard nothing from them I don't think I heard so that was December the 16th and I didn't hear from them again until mid-January and I called the police station every day to ask if he'd been released and what was going on uh and because it was so near to Christmas the police officers who had attended my crime ha- were on their Christmas holidays. So they weren't there and there was no one in the station who knew about my case to answer the question. So I didn't find out that he was released the next day until the middle of January. So, yeah. We'd like to thank our newest Patreon subscribers, Heather M., Jessica J., Caitlin, Lisa J., Liz, Victoria B, Heidi, Jennifer, KCP, Yukneka W, Aaron, Victoria S, Aurelia W, Ruth R, Mary Beth D, Lydia H, Madeline C, Beth G, Kiara K. Jamie S. Jamie Lynn S. Rachel C. Kelly B. Carolyn C. And Amber G. Thank you all for joining us on Patreon. We really appreciate it. See you there. What was your reaction when you found out that he was released? I think I was frustrated and angry that I... You know, especially in the few weeks after that happened, I was very scared of being in my own home. I didn't know where he was. I didn't know if he'd gone back to where he lived, which was like four hours drive away from London. Uh, like I, I think I probably found out that he was back home from his own Twitter, where he continued to tweet as if I think he did a tweet saying, "I'm not allowed to contact you because of the." restraining you know there was like a his bail conditions he wasn't allowed to contact me which he couldn't have anyway because he didn't have any of my contact details um he went I'm not allowed to contact you because of my restraining order but um I'll see you I'll you know hopefully see you soon or something which again I screenshotted and sent to the police going this is proof that he like how is this not directly about me and how can this not prove that, you know, so many of the other things that have been said also, that is a form of contact. Is that not breaking his bail conditions? He's directly addressing me. And I know that I found this because I'm looking at his profile, but also he's turned up on my doorstep and he was detailing it on Twitter, which I wasn't looking at. And he could very easily do that again and tweet about it. And that would be the only way that I would know. Um, so yeah, I think I was just quite angry and I felt quite let down by the police on that front because, you know, I couldn't, I didn't want to leave my house. I was like, even the idea that he'd like touch the doorbell on the front of my house, that he'd been stood there kind of like sent shivers down my spine anytime I walked up the, like up the pathway and friends of mine who live nearby were very helpful. Like a friend of mine's husband or my friend would come and like pick me up and drive me to the tube station if I needed to go to work or any of those things, because I was too scared that I would leave the front door and he could just be stood there. Um, so I, it was nice to have someone that I knew stood outside and text me to let me know that no one was outside the front of the house apart from them and that I could like come down and feel safe about it. So yeah, it was just quite upsetting and scary as well, not knowing anything for like a whole month. Were you in fear for your life? Did you think that he would physically harm you? I don't think I did, no. I think none of none of the messages had sort of suggested violence or any of those sort of things, but the fact that he he had paid to get my address, the sort of the lengths that he'd gone to to try and physically 
see me and um, and speak to me in person. That was what made me scared um, because I obviously didn't know what he expected from that. If he claimed that we were in a relationship, like would he have tried to, you know, touch me or like physically do something with me? I don't know. I'm glad I never found out, but I think that it was kind of the unknown. There was nothing stated that he was going to harm me or like he never mentioned any of those sort of things. Um, But I think it was the fear that you don't know what's going to happen and you don't know what this person wants from you. Uh, when they claim to be in a relationship with you, there's obviously certain aspects that come with relationships. And I didn't know if that was what he would try and do, or if he wanted to do that, or if it was just quite like a plain, like obsessive, just wanting to see me in person and track me down kind of thing. Do you know if the police ever questioned him on why he began stalking you? I don't know. Uh, I know purely because one of the police officers who attended the crime let it slip and there was no like official noting on this that he had done this to someone before I think they mentioned he'd done it at least twice before Uh, I'm not sure if it had been like via Twitter or online but he had like turned up at someone's house uh, who he'd obviously been harassing and stalking Uh, I'm not sure where it was I don't know if it was in London as well I don't know if it was nearer to where he came from and and when it had happened or to who and when. Um, but yeah, I, I knew that he'd done it before and I'm sure that is something that they shouldn't have told me because it wasn't like on an official record. Um, but it seemed like it was a pattern of behavior that he did with women. I'm assuming I'm not entirely sure. Um, so I don't think they did question him on why he did it um, or what started it because he just claimed that we were in a relationship and that was what he knew. What kind of update did the police give you when they reached back out to you? So when the police got back in contact in January, um, it was a new uh, police officer who was in charge of the case. I never saw the two police officers that attended the crime again. I'm sure that's to do with the fact that, you know, you have different duties as a police officer. So this one who contacted me um, was l- let me know that because he had pleaded not guilty to stalking and harassment when he'd been charged, that we had to go to court. So there would be a court date, um, which again was like another horrifying addition to it of going oh my god he's already turned up on my doorstep now I have to possibly see him again um which I'm sure is something that he wants and I do not want um and I just wanted that like whole scenario and chapter of things to just be over so it I think this was the middle of January and the court date was set for February, mid-February, which meant it was like another month before uh, we would have the court date, um, which is horrible because it again drags it out. I'm again nervous that he can still turn up at my door uh, now that he has that information on me. Um, And so, yeah, in the lead up to that, I was just quite anxious and scared but also I think I was starting to get back on with my life because you kind of have to and just have the hope that the worst thing that you're expecting has already happened and hopefully won't again and that if he does at that point in time it would be breaking his bail conditions and he would be immediately arrested and imprisoned for breaking his bail conditions um so then we went to court it all was like a huge shambles. I'm, I'm sure it's very different in like the American system to how it is in the UK, but it was kind of like a shitty little courthouse, like in the local area. We turned up. I had tried to, I'd spoken to the police officer beforehand and he'd offered me certain protections for the court date. Um, you know, having a screen around me whilst I was testifying against him uh, so he couldn't see me. Um, I would be able to see everyone in the court, but it would be he would have to leave the room whilst I was brought in to sit behind the screen. Uh, 
And also, I he said, you'll be in the witness protection room whilst you're waiting to go into the courtroom. So that w- felt good. I was felt protected in that. But obviously, getting to the court, it's not a big place. Uh, you don't know when he's turning up. You don't know if you're turning up at the same time. There's like a big area, waiting area for the people who aren't in witness protection. That's where they sit, is in the main entrance. To my knowledge, I don't remember if I saw him, but I feel like I would remember if I did. (laughs) But I was very quickly taken in. We had to go through like a security gate. uh, And then I got taken with my dad and my friend to the witness protection room. We then waited in there for about three hours because there was another case in the courtroom before us. Um, And that was obviously quite nerve wracking. And very bad for my anxiety because you're just sat there waiting to go in and finish this all off um but also knowing that you're in the same building as this guy it was horrible that you know if you went out to the bathroom that maybe you might bump into him like all of these kind of things you're again in the same building as the one person that you don't want to see and are petrified of And I think after waiting for about three hours, the lawyer for the prosecution, who was who I was testifying for, giving evidence for, um, came in to tell us that this guy had turned up without any representation. He hadn't organized any lawyers. So I think he, someone had reached out to him to offer to be his lawyer and he had never confirmed it and never followed up. He just turned up to the court with no defense uh, and no legal team, which meant we couldn't do the case. We couldn't try the case because it would be unfair to him because he didn't have any representation, which just seemed mad because it's up to him to do that. And it also just felt very frustrating because it felt like he'd just turned up to try and see me and and that was it. And it was so, again, such like the horrible sticky feeling that you go, this isn't like a fun game for me. I'm not, I don't want to see you. I don't know who you are. And there's no way in hell that this is going to be like some sort of romantic meeting in a courthouse where you're charged with stalking me. Um So at that point, the police officer who had been there said, you're free to go. Um, Then the lawyer said the next day that the the courthouse was free was in April, which meant another two months of waiting. Um, So that was a big blow because it just felt like, and I also had to check that my restraining order, his bail conditions would be extended for that length of time, because if they weren't, he could turn up again and, blah, blah, blah. Um, And we had to ask the police officer who said, you're free to go, to go and check around and outside the courthouse in case he was waiting there to see me. Like they didn't think about many of the things that obviously as a person who had received that kind of unwanted attention and contact is constantly thinking of going, they could be outside, they could be doing this, they could be here, they could be waiting for me, like they could be back outside my house again. We're at the courthouse that is in the borough that I live, which is like a 10 minute walk to my house. Like he's had to come to London again for this court case and he's nearby where I live and knows what the address is. So yeah, The police officer went and did that quite begrudgingly and then he'd the guy had gone so we my dad drove me home uh and then it was another two months of waiting we went back to go to the courthouse again the same process except this time i think our our case was the first one in of the day so we didn't have to wait around thank god so I think we just had to wait whilst he was questioned on his own. I wasn't allowed in the courtroom whilst for any of the rest of the trial. Actually, I'm not sure I might have been, but I didn't want to see him. And if I had gone back in to watch the rest of the case, I wouldn't have been behind a protective screen or anything. So I didn't want to. But I got taken in. He had to leave the room whilst I was brought in. And I sort of sat behind this like screen so I could see the ju- uh, like the jurors and the two lawyers and then I was asked a lot of questions about who this man was how I knew who he was had to basically describe to like five judges what Twitter was 
how like blocking worked. I think it just felt like so, like I said before, I hadn't really explained this to my dad until this guy was on my doorstep because it doesn't feel like real life really. You know, Twitter, explaining Twitter out loud just seems stupid. Like it's something that happens on your phone and on your computer, but it's not something that you like actively talk about someone retweeting your tweet or, you know, it's, it's very much like an online thing. So to then be in a courtroom where you're having to describe like bit by bit how Twitter works, what you do on it, what this person had been doing on Twitter to me, the whole process of blocking how I'd accidentally followed him because the block button was next to the follow button. Like you could just see that these people didn't understand what I was talking about. And I think when I was sort of giving evidence, I felt quite petrified which is so mad to think that like I was going to be not punished, but like they'd go, well, she obviously not that I, not that they thought I knew him, but that like somehow I would be blamed for it or they'd be like, well, she led him on or any of these things. Like it can really come into your head. And so I think those questions, that was when the prosecution were questioning me, who I was giving evidence for. And they'd said to me, you know, don't take what the defense, the questions that his defense uh, ask you to personally, because they're just trying to get a client off and it's their job. Um, but it was very scary. And, you know, her. F- I think the lawyer's first statement was, you know, I intend to prove today that you do know this man and that you have been having a relationship with him for several months. And I just thought, oh my God, like, what do I what am I supposed to do? Like, this is horrific. I, th- what proof do I have <laughs> that I have a boyfriend? My boyfriend's not here. Like it's all, it all builds up. Uh, and, but then again, her one piece of evidence was the notification email that he'd got in July when I'd accidentally followed him and then immediately blocked him. That was all she had. And, you know, just to see that the screenshot of that tweet come up on the screen it was kind of, you almost wanted to laugh, but also at the same time thought, shit, like that's, that's sort of some sort of evidence against me in this case. Um, and I could hear, I think he was kind of put into, uh, like a, not a protective box, but he was like in a separate area behind like perspex or glass where he could hear everything that was going on, but he couldn't, he wasn't in the same room as me. So he couldn't like stand up and walk over to me. Um, but I think there was like a microphone in there and there she was asked at one point, his lawyer was asking some questions and I mentioned about my boyfriend and he like whispered things under his breath. Like, that's not true. That's not true. Which is just like horrifying and like send shivers down your spine. Um, even to just like hear his voice or like for him to react that way. And I think I was just so like sweaty and nervous. And then it was all done. I don't even know how long I was in there for, maybe like 20 minutes, half an hour. Um, and then that was it. I, he left the room. I got taken out of the room. And then the, the case carried on with him in there. Um, and I got to go home. And I just had to keep calling up the courthouse to find out what the verdict was again like I had called the police station every day to ask if he'd been released I kind of did the same thing like every hour on the hour calling the courthouse saying do you have the information about the trial from this morning Uh, and finally I think about 5 p.m so we'd been in court at 10 in the morning um the woman that I spoke to on the phone said that uh, I had a restraining order for two years Uh, he had to complete 80 hours of community service that he'd also that he'd been found guilty of stalking and harassment. Uh, and he also had to pay a 200 pound fine directly to me as in not that he had my bank details, but he had to pay it to someone and then it was sent to me, which I was not expecting and seems like quite an odd thing. I've never heard of that happening before. Um, but obviously that was like a huge, huge relief The the restraining order in particular, because it meant that any time like, that he, if he tried to contact me in any shape or form, like Twitter, any of these things, he could be arrested. 
So yeah, that was kind of weirdly quite a, f- a ending to it for me. I feel like I still had a bit of a like hangover from it for a few months where you it was still in the back of my head quite a lot. But because it had been dragged out for such a long time and the court dates and that sort of process, I think there's nothing <laughs> there's nothing like like a trial in a court case to make you realize that you're not going out with somebody and that if you do this again you will end up in prison um and I think that finally got through to him and yeah from that point on I've never had anything from him again talking about this I think I've been quite nervous about doing this podcast because I think it brings it up again like I really shut it down quite quickly without realizing it and was like well that's done (laughs) and I'm safe now and I'm okay And I don't tend to think about it that often. But when you do sit and think about it, you go, oh my God, like that's insane that that happened. It's insane that it happened via Twitter. It's insane that he managed to turn up on my doorstep. Like there's not many, from learning since then about other stalking cases and having spoken to like the media about it and journalists about it who are trying to campaign in the UK to get a stalker's register for like repeat offenders because it doesn't exist. Um, I realized that this case is incredibly unusual in the sense that it isn't violent. It wasn't violent and that it wasn't someone that I knew. Like someone stalking you over the internet is incredibly rare. So many of the cases are to do with like ex-boyfriends or like someone that uh, people have met on like dating apps and things like that, people who were like spurned and rejected or like family members. Like I said, from listening to one of your episodes about the woman who was stalked by her father, like I think you just realize how unusual this is, but also how lucky I am that in the grand scheme of things, it was dealt with incredibly quickly. And even though I was very frustrated with the police's behavior, that there are some people who have been so badly let down by the police in these instances that some of them are A, not alive anymore, or B, have had to like change their name, move house, are still in the process where even if they've been to court, you know, several times, they're still dealing with a stalker. So yeah, I think it's, it's an overwhelming thing, but there are people who are in much worse positions who've dealt with stalkers. Do you think the sentence that he got was fair? I was never entirely sure what I wanted from the process other than I never wanted him to be able to contact me or see me ever again. Uh, I think I became aware because of his Twitter that he was on the autism spectrum. Uh, I'm not sure how severe his case was, but he would tweet about it, that he was autistic. So I think I was aware that he had you know, that he was on the spectrum and that could affect his behavior. Um, So I think initially when I didn't know that, I just wanted him to go to prison in the sense that I just didn't want to have to deal with this ever again. And that seemed like a final thing, but also it doesn't because people get out of prison and he hadn't like physically harmed me. Um, So it wasn't realistic that he would be in there for a long time anyway. Uh, But I think I just wanted... I just wanted it to be noted that he had done this before and that he could do it again. And for him to be, for that to be noted and known on a record. Uh, And yeah, I think I just wanted the restraining order really, because I realized that was the best thing I could get from this situation. And it meant that I got what I wanted, which is if he did ever come near me again, that he would be punished for it. Um, and that that hopefully that would be a big enough thing to stop him doing that. So yeah, I do think it was, I do think it was good and fair. I think the only other further thing that could have happened was that he would have been like kept an eye on or that he would have had some sort of um, treatment for it, you know, to have some sort of counsel or guiding guidance towards changing that kind of behavior, um, which I think is what people are hoping for with a stalker's register that if it is noted down like even the most minor of stalking offenses you 
you know, that behavior really snowballs and builds. And if you can take note of it early doors, like if they had done that with this guy in the first two cases that weren't noted down, maybe it never would have happened to me. So yeah, I think that's all I could have hoped for really. What advice do you have for other people in your situation? I think that you just need to trust your gut. If you feel weird about someone and if their like interactions, whether it's like online or in person, make you feel uncomfortable or if they're sort of turning up places that you haven't told them that you are uh, and they're sort of gathering information on you from social media and like things like that, just to be aware of it uh, and trust your instinct and like screenshot things just keep a record of it if you're worried, even if it's something so minor, because you need that trail. If it goes any further, you can sort of stop something in its tracks or attempt to, uh, to try and protect yourself with that kind of information. I'm very lucky that I had screenshotted that blog um, to send to a friend just out of fear, because that was one of the only pieces of evidence that I had that he had directly contacted me because I hadn't realized what situation I was in. Um, so yeah, I've had quite a few people contact me about things like that since then. And my advice is just screenshot things, keep evidence of the the interactions and the behavior because that is your only proof really. What's life like for you now? Much nicer. <laughs> yeah, I think I it's affected me and it has changed the way I do things, uh, particularly with social media. I think the police who attended my crime immediately went, you need to delete all of your social media accounts and you can't have any sort of like online presence anymore. And I just the thought that was such an extreme reaction because I hadn't been put, I hadn't put where I lived publicly on anywhere. Uh, on the internet, on any of my social media profiles, the only way that he'd found me was from my name. And I can't like just change what I'm called. I mean, I can, but it's a very extreme thing to do. And that was how he f paid for my address on a directory's website. Like I can't change who I am. <laughs> um, so I think I didn't delete all of my social media profiles. I thought that was a mad thing to do, but I'm definitely very cautious with them. Uh, and I think I suggest to other people to be cautious of it as well. Like, you know, even filming yourself, like on the local bus route, like being on the local bus, people can screenshot things like people, if they want to find you, they can find you. And yeah, I think it just changed my life in that way, which I don't think is negative. I think it's probably quite positive that I'm more cautious, but it just, yeah, it just changes it a bit because you're more wary of things. But other than that, I'm very happy. <laughs> Great. Beth, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. If anyone out there is in need of help or is a victim of stalking, please reach out. You can find a list of resources on our Instagram at Strictly Stalking Pod. You can watch episodes at youtube.com slash Strictly Stalking. And now we're on Patreon, where you can sign up for an exclusive bonus episode each month, live chat sessions, and check out show merchandise. Just go to patreon.com Strictly Stalking. I'm Jake Deptula. And I'm Jamie Beebe. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of Strictly Stalking. <laughs>